We good. We good. My son does this. That means that we are on Facebook. Nico, I need my phone to answer people's comments. Okay, guys, I have my phone so you can leave comments. I'm going to try and do my best to answer people's comments today. Okay, it's the first time I'm going to do that. So uh, I'm going to try to make it work. Uh, all right. Every oh! <laughs> Everybody, thank you for being here today at L'Apéro Clock with PRV on my fantastic guest. Not, not just a guest, the guest. Oh. Ah, bah, si. The, we have a the? <laughs> the, the, the guest. So today, guys, I'm very happy, super happy to have Chef Roland Passo, uh, who is with us uh, a lot of you know Chef Roland Passo. Uh, if you are from San Francisco, if you've been to San Francisco, uh, well, most likely you've been to Roland's restaurant. And if you haven't been, shame on you. Uh, it's never too late because he still has other business. And we'll talk about that. But first of all, Roland, thank you for being here. Thank you for me, having me as a guest. I mean, I think uh, we did an attempt a few months ago when I was still at La Folie. And, uh, <laughs> We had a little bit of difficulties, but you know, <laughs> c'est la vie. <laughs> yeah. This one's going to be better. <laughs> good, yeah, good, one. good. But, you know, cross your finger. That's right. Otherwise, That's we'll just drink and we'll talk and nobody will listen anyway, you know, at the end. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Santé. <laughs> Boom. You're right. Hey, thing. So, Roland. For people who don't know you, if you don't mind, I did this, and this is you. <laughs> oh my gosh! So uh, I'm good. You did good. You did. I'm glad you did it in one page. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. You just I put the good thing. Stuff. You didn't put the bad things. I printed a lot of things about you. I had a lot of stuff, but. Uh, I'm going to try to give a brief introduction for people who don't know who you are. Then, you know, they'll be like, well, who is Roland Passo? Chef Roland Passo. Well, let me, do you mind if I take two minutes? Is that okay with you, of Roland? Of course, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. And then we go into the details and we learn more about your experience. But I'm going to try to sum it up. If two words, three words to sum you up, when I look at all those interviews and articles will be passion. You are a man of passion. You love people. And you are an expert in food. So that's the three things that when I read all those stuff, saw those videos, those three things always seem to be very uh, evident. Um, so that's who you are. If I have to sum it up, that's you. Where are you from? You are born in uh, the city, beautiful uh, city of uh, Lyon in uh, France, for people who don't know, Lyon, this is the flag of Lyon. This is the capital of food in France, not hey, Paris, hey. Lyon. If you want the best food, the best chef are trained in Lyon. So this is where you're from, you're born in Lyon. You started your career in Lyon at the age of 14 years old. I was a baby, I still am. <laughs> But that's early. I mean, you know, it's uh, yeah, well, well, but you know, those days we start we started early. You know, fourteen, fifteen. If you were not that good in school, you had to find a job somewhere. So you were either going to be in mechanic or in food, in a restaurant, and uh, some type. You know, I mean, it's usually where you end up uh, going. And uh, I was not too good at mechanic, so you know, food was more my thing. And uh, I did already at the time was a gourmand. I love to eat. Wow. And I love to <laughs> lift up the casserole that my mother was prepping when I came back from the school. So, you know, it was uh, of an early age. <laughs> a passion. A passion for eating, at least. A passion for eating. Well, that's good. I'm trying to check my phone as we go, Roland. Huh? Sorry for that. I'm just trying to see if anyone has things. And Roland, so you studied at age 14 at the Léon de Lyon with Chef Paul Lacombe. Then you went on to Pierre Orsi restaurant, great first name, Pierre, fantastic. Then you moved to the US, they ship you over. They say, hey, time to go. 
You went to learn. Yeah, from they kicked me out. They, they kicked you out. out. It was good. I was not even 20 years old when I moved to United States. And I moved to a great city that I still love today. You know, I think it's one of the greatest cities in the in United States, Chicago. So we go through that. that Hold on, I'm going to ask you a question about all that stuff. I'm just trying all to right. go. Okay, let go, go, go. <laughs> I won't let you talk anyway. <laughs> and you worked at Le Francais in Wheeling, Illinois with Jean Banchet. And we'll talk about him. Then you went to Le Castle. Uh, you opened Le Castle or you worked at Le Castle. Le Castel, Castel, pardon, Le Castel, 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 Castel. Castel in San Francisco in 1980. Then you went to Texas. You went to Dallas, Texas, where you worked at the French room at the Adolphus Hotel. Uh, so you went from Le Francais, Le Castel, Le Castel, French room, all very French name. And finally, in 1988, you opened La Folie with your lovely wife, Jamie, and your brother, George, uh, who was handling the wine. We'll talk about that. So 22 years ago, uh, your restaurant was a huge, massive success in the city of San Francisco. You made a name for yourself, not only here, but internationally, with your knowledge on what you were able to achieve in San Francisco. You got four stars review by the San Francisco Chronicle, right there, which is not easy to have because Michael ba uh, Bauer, Michael Bauer, yes. Bauer was very, very, I mean, he, very hard man to please. You were able to please him, uh, not only once, but throughout your career. Uh, what to say about your achievement? You were on Zaga survey many times, on Gold Mio many times. You got the James Beard Award in 1980 for Best Rising Star Chef, s'il vous plaît. Congratulations on this. Uh, you, you got, uh, in 1991, you were induced as a Maître Cuisinier de France which is a very hard recognition to have as well. Um, you, what else? Uh, you, are, you were named as one of the eight wonders of the Bay Area dining. Not bad. And I mean, I could go on. I mean, you have a lot of uh, recognition. My point is, uh, you're the man. I'm the man. <laughs> You make me feel old, man, you know. No, no. Soon you're going to call me a legend. You, st you still are the man. Don't worry, you still are the man. <laughs> no, that's good, that's good, that's good, so, I like it. And so that was about La Folie, but then that was not enough. You're like, well, I'm very successful, but there is a lot more to be done. Well, so here are a few businesses you are involved with, and I'm going to put in the background the pictures of those guys. One of those, Left Bank. One of the other one, the most recent one, Meso, M-E-S-O, Meso in San Jose, in Santana Row. And let me try to grab, I have one more I'm going to show. Uh, where is it? I need to find the logo on there. Sorry, guys. LB Steak. LB Steak. So you are involved with LB Steak. You are involved with Meso. <clears throat> you are involved with the brasseries. I've got three brasseries. So that's what you've achieved. And you are cheating because this is, you're working on those. Meso is brand new. So this is you in, your, in a nutshell. <sighs> eh. I have to take off my hat. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like, the, I like your haircut. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> show me those hair, show me those hair. Monsieur de la Housse, Monsieur de la Housse, the French, uh, you know, JT. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 oui, oui, c'est vrai, c'est vrai, that's right. Well, it's better with a hat. So, well, you are, you have an unusual profile. You've been very successful. And let's share how you become successful. Let's go back. Let's go back to your roots. Tell us your story. Tell us what makes you who you are. Uh, let's start with Lyon in general. Can you tell us about your beginning in Lyon? And okay, I'll, I'll tell you first of all, because I'm going to correct you on a few points. Sure. Because, yes, and it's not your fault because no. I say I'm, I'm born in Lyon because, you know, a lot of people have a hard time for pretty much saying the town I was born in was is the capital of Beaujolais and it's called Villefranche-sur-Saône. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, forget that. So it's long. When you put that on your passport <laughs> or when you uh, try to put that on filling up papers, everybody <laughs> say, well, what's that? Villefranche-sur-what? Roland, then they ask you, can you spell it? 
Sure. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and when you have to spell sown, S-A-O-N-E with an accent, circumflex uh, between the, <laughs> you know, no, it's no, like, you, oh, come on. No, no working yeah. out. Mm -mm. So anyway, uh, yeah, so I was born in villefranche sur saône uh, I moved to Lyon with, uh, when I was about eight years old. Uh, our parents uh, uh, moved to Lyon and uh, went to school over there, obviously. And uh, like I was telling you, I was uh, not the best in mathematics and uh, not the best. I mean, you know, I was doing pretty good in school, but, you know, when it started getting more into the college and all that, I didn't really uh, shine that well anymore. So it was time to find a job and uh, bring some bread at home, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Even if it was not much money, at least, you know, you were starting your apprenticeship and that was important at the time. And I think it's still important today, you know, then people with passion should start an apprenticeship, probably not at 14 years old or 15 years old, but more, you know, in the twenties, you know, you're a little more mature and it's a little bit easier then because you have a little bit more education. Got it. So in Lyon, when I work in Lyon, uh, I started working. I, I did some schooling also. Uh, uh, I did the Lycée Technique Hôtelier uh, in Vénissieux, within the suburb of uh, Lyon. And uh, I was going with my mobilette because I didn't have my driving license yet at the time. And uh, I was working in restaurant. And uh, some of them uh, were one, one of my uh, fond memories. I mean, uh, I work in restaurant in Provence, but I also work in a restaurant above Lyon, in a col de la Luère. And the chef who had that restaurant, well, it was called Le Petit Col. He was right underneath the col de la Luère and was the chef, the ex-chef of La Mère Brasier. La Mère oh. Brasier was the first woman chef to have three stars. She had two three-star restaurants, one in Lyon, one at the col de la Luère. And in the, uh, in the 50s, you know, all the... Um, the dignitary were coming, you know, like uh, the president and a uh, uh, lot of movie stars and all that. And it was uh, quite a lady. She was a Navy set lady. You can see online, Mère Brasier. And she, she was a character. She was really tough. Uh, Bocuse worked there. Uh, uh, many, many chefs have worked uh, up there. And uh, she will kick the ass of the guys, I tell you. She was really tough. So Roland, she had two restaurants, three stars Michelin. Yes, one in the city in Lyon and one at the Col de la Luère. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe in San Francisco, we could have a female chef, even though she doesn't like to be called a female chef, that could have potentially one day two, three stars she, Michelin. She, she has definitely uh, uh, shine with her star. I was talking to her just yesterday, matter of fact. And uh, Dominique is awesome, and she uh, uh, is doing extremely, extremely well. Uh, obviously, during those times, you know, it's very difficult. She was telling me yesterday that she was ready to reopen. And uh, of course, with the COVID, they decided to close back. She already had reservations. She had to call all, all her reservations. She was booked. And, uh, you know, it's sad. But, you know, uh, we know during those tough times, there is always you know, I mean, opportunities at the end, you know, I mean, there will be some, uh, you know, I think it'll be, unfortunately, a lot of restaurants won't be able to survive, but the one who will are going to really be very, very successful. I truly believe that after all that is over, you know, there'll, there'll be definitely a web, uh, first of all, of customers wanting to go out. You know, I think people are tired, you know, it's great to get take out, take out, take out, that come in a cardboard box, but, you know, it's a lot better to eat in a plate and all that. So now, you know, you can at least sit outside. But a lot of restaurants in the city, you know, with the weather we have in the summer, I mean, you're freezing. Yes, you have a fire pit, you know, and you wear a bonnet and gloves and jackets, you know, ski jacket maybe. You know, otherwise it's, it's tough. It's really tough for uh, restaurateurs and, uh, uh, to survive in that environment. And, you know... Unfortunately, this is what it is. And, you know, life is full of uh, good and bad surprises. I remember ourselves when we opened La Folie in 1989, 88. In 1989, we had the earthquake. And uh, that really, you know, messed up with our business. We were really suffering for uh, 
uh, you know, I thought it was going to last a few months, maybe maybe a few weeks even at the time. And it ended up lasting almost the entire year for us because we were brand new. We were up in the March 88. You know, we were a year and a half old, really. And uh, it just killed our business. First of all, people from Marine or East Bay were not coming in anymore. And I asked. So we just had the people from the city and a lot of people in the city still didn't know us yet. We didn't have really a, a strong base of customer yet. And, you know, it takes years to build up your customer base. So, you know, it took us a long time to recover. We, we, we had some tough time. But, you know, there is always challenges. And in doing those challenges, you reinvent yourself. I remember during the, that days, of the earthquake because we were doing so, so poorly. I remember my wife was like, oh my God, how are we going to pay our bill? You know, and uh, so I created what we call the petite folie. And it's when I really started doing my food from Lyon, really, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, I will do uh, uh, escargot. Uh, I did the parsley and garlic soup with escargot. I did, uh, I was doing the confit, beef bourguignons. So pretty much bistro food at that stage. And the menu was $25 for three courses, no choice. So every week was the same, uh, was, was a different menu, but no choices. So it bring us great press. Michael Burr did love us for that as well. He, he did, you know, and thank God, you know, he put us on Food and One and a lot of your national publication as well. So that helped us survive. And this is what it is right now. It's surviving. How do you survive? Take out, you know, outside seating and doing other things, you know, and I think it's what's going to be, you know, some people are really, really clever in the sense of, you know, they prepare kits, you know, they send the, the, the directions and they do it live online sometimes, you know. So I think people are getting really clever. And I think in every difficulty, there's opportunities. And I truly believe that, you know, and the people who are strong and who are smart really also as well are going to shine and survive. And, you know, not everybody is going to be lucky. Unfortunately, you can be, you know, as smart as you are. But, you know, if people don't come to your doors, then, you know, it's going to be very difficult to survive. And I think the, the people also who have been longer in business are going to be able to survive a little bit longer. Because, you know, restaurant business is, is tough. Uh, our profit margins are small. So, you know, a lot of restaurants in, in, in a restaurant business, it used to be, okay, if you do 10%, you're doing good. People who are doing over 10%, they were doing really good. Now, four to six percent, if that, with all the way the city is structured, is very, very difficult. So it's a difficult time for, for those, those restaurateurs. And the people who have a little bit of money in a bank are going to survive because they have enough maybe for a year. But the one who just have a few months ahead of us, of them, they won't, they won't be able to survive. I think it's going to be very tough. Isn't that amazing when we are not from the industry? To, I mean, when you talk about four to six percent margin, we're in the Silicon Valley. I don't think there are too many businesses who are able to raise a lot of money by saying we're going to make four or six percent margin because that sounds <laughs> no it's it's ridiculous it's very you know so it's why we're counting on customers to come and to help us really you know i mean yes. uh you know i mean yes it, it, it's it's really yes. really tough for all those restaurateurs and it's dominique or uh, gerald irigoyen from picorade just went over there at fabulous lunch the other day uh, or, or Claude Lotoric at 165, or, yes. you know, Laurent Manric at Café de la Presse. And I'm talking about French restaurants because, you know, they're my buddies. But, you know, uh, uh, I know, you know, there's Laurence Jossols, you know, with, uh, who, who has uh, the restaurant and he, he closed one of them uh, in, um, uh, what's the name of it now? Uh, uh, oh. He used to work for me and you know those guys are, 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 are wonderful but you know some restaurants won't survive they cannot keep up with everything even ourselves you know i mean 
we're hoping to keep all our businesses, you know, the Nets Left Bank, Meso, and uh, LB Steak. Uh, but we know how difficult it is, and it's dealing also with the landlords and, you know, and the cities. And the different cities have different rules, you know, and San Francisco have never been really very easy on helping the small businesses. So, you know, hopefully, you know, they learn and they help us out a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, landlords also have the role to play. You know, are they expecting us to pay full rent? Uh, it's almost impossible. But on the other hand, I understand also their, their view. They still have to pay mortgage for a lot of them. Some don't, but some do. And they have to pay the taxes and all that. So, you know, I mean, you need to negotiate with your landlord in those tough times because otherwise you won't be able to survive. And the best way is to negotiate, not to tell the landlord, hey, you know what? I'm not paying my own. Go, go to hell. Uh, I don't think it's going to sit very well with the landlord. It's better to go see the landlord. What can we do? What can we work together? Right now, my business is down 75%. You know, so can I pay you 75% of the rent less or 50% less? You know, everything is negotiable. But I don't think you can expect any business to say, it's going to be free. Nothing is free. Eventually, you're going to have to pay. So, you know, you negotiate and maybe instead of paying right away, maybe you pay next year when your business is back in, fully bus in full business. So it's kind of a loan. We have no interest maybe for, from the landlord. And it's the way to look at things. I think, you know, it's the best way to look at things in that case, you know, I mean, tough time, tough decisions and landlords are in the same situation than we are, except they own the building and uh, they're sitting, you know, with a lot of money, you know, invested and some of them own the building clear. So, you know, it's a little bit easier for them, but, you know, I think you cannot expect them not to receive any type of payment because there is no business, you know, and maybe some of them will say, okay, you know, we'll give you a month's free rent, and then after it's 50%. You know, the first month, nobody was open. The first month and a half, maybe even. You know, so, you know, let's see what people can come up with. I will suggest that everybody who have their business negotiate with the landlords and sit down at the table and maybe share a glass of wine, get them drunk a little bit, you know. Apéro <laughs> 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 time. Apéro time. Apéro time. You know, I think everything is negotiable and everything is the way to both survive. Otherwise, people are going to give back their keys and declare bankruptcy. And landlord don't want that. You know, they, you know, it'll be years before they can find back a, a good tenants. Specifically, they have good tenants. They don't want that. They want to keep their tenants. Well, this is very, this is very valuable information you are giving us, Roland. Yeah, I, I mean, anyone who is in the food business, I think, can. I mean, you know, those are great advice. How? May I ask you how you how how you did the deal with your workforce with your team? Because you know we talked about that before. You have been successful because of the people around you, you know your close family, your wife, your brother, but your staff. Your staff is part of your family, and you've been the, able the staff to is be... the you know in the restaurant business the staff is our family because you know we 12, 14 hours a day uh, for some of us together. You know, I mean, at the beginning it was six days a week and it's not just me and my wife and my brother, but it's also uh, the team, you know, and the team in the kitchen work longer than the dining room, I have to say, but it's every day. We, we share a lot of uh, passion, love, uh, also sadness together. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's really a business where we are a family, we are an equipe. We are working together and uh, it's very important that uh, you treat them as a family, you know, I mean, they understand your difficulty when they are and they understand when you're successful, you know, then they're part of that success as well, you know. Uh, so, you know, you want them to stick with you and I have to say for my team at La Folie, then it's from the servers to the sommeliers to the dishwasher to the cook to the chef, everybody, when I announced that we were closing on, in January, then we were going to close in March 15, not knowing that COVID was going to happen, 
you know, we knew that Crazy. there was something going on, but you know, we didn't know that we were going to close. Everybody stayed. I didn't have one person leave, not one, in a kitchen, in a dining room. And, you know, I made them really a promise to find them a job. Unfortunately, you know, I had people set up at the Four Seasons, I had people set up with other friends and all that. But unfortunately, that thing happened and it's make it difficult for everybody because right now nobody is hiring anybody. You know, they're retaining some people and the other ones are now furloughed. And, uh, you know, it's well, surviving mode. It's surviving mode. Roland, Roland, maybe if someone who is listening to us, maybe maybe if they have an opportunity where they should reach out to you and maybe you could... Yeah, yes, it. absolutely. Uh, so I have, uh, some of my employees have already put them in, in, in contact with some people who are opening restaurants, believe it or not, at that time. So, uh, you know, we hoping that that will work for them. You know, my chef de cuisine, uh, one of my sous chef and his wife who was one of our best servers at La Folie. So uh, I think, you know, I'm here for my prep cook who's been with me for 18 years. So I've been using him here and there at La Folie to clean up, finishing cleaning up. And I am really trying to find him a job because he's awesome. He was with me 18 years. He rarely calls sick. And, uh, you know, I want to find him a good home. That's why I had him work. I was going to uh, have uh, uh, the chef of the Four Seasons in San Francisco was really interested in having him in his banquet kitchen. And it was perfect for him because he was going to get benefit and all that and a lot of things for his family. And he was really excited. But now, you know, I mean, Four Seasons is closed, you know, and uh, there is no, unfortunately, no job. Uh, Roland, j just a little paraphrase. As you're talking, it's funny because on uh, on Facebook Live we have some comments from some of your previous customers, and uh, and it's funny because we had a bunch of people just letting us know what was their favorite dish. So I just want you to know that the signature quail dish. Oh, the quail and squab. Yeah, so Maria, I Maria Robinson seems to really like oh, that. Yeah. Dish. The, uh, bonjour, Maria. Yeah, Ma so Maria is watching you. Uh, the chef's Colorado lamb as well seems to be yeah. a dish that... Uh, <laughs> but the, the lamb like. is not from Colorado. It's from, it, it, it's from uh, Davis or near Davis in Dixon. Ah. From uh, Amy Farm. A little farm. I, I met the farmer and it's him and his daughters and they're doing an awesome job. Awesome job, Amy and Dixon, near Sacramento, right. near Davis. We have we have someone else. Uh, Greg Chase was just saying, uh, your spirit is alive and well despite all the madness of COVID. Many blessings from Colorado. He's there. Bonjour, Greg. To you, your family, and your staff. Stay strong. We, we miss you, Greg. Looking Maybe forward also, to see you. So you got people. You got people right now who are you know. You know, thinking of you and your staff and, uh, and your family, so that's uh, so. No, it's it, it always it's really important to hear that and to see that. And I have to say, the last three months of the La Folie were just awesome. We've, you know, it, and I wish it was always like this, but it was crazy. It was La Folie. It was La Folie every day. And believe me, I had so many people who tell me. Just tell them you're going to be open another month. Just tell them you're going to. I have a friend who did that in Seattle. And I didn't want to do that because, you know, I made my commitments and I, I didn't want to be like, hey, you know, I was just, you know, like feeling like then I'm a, a, a little uh, marchand de tapis, you yeah. know, a rug uh, salesman. So, you know, it was my decision and my wife's decisions. And we have decided there was time. It was time for us to retire. It was time for us to move on and, and work on our next phase of our life. And this is what we're going to do. You know? But so let me ask you a difficult question. We were talking about family, right? Family and and you have you still have a lot of businesses. I mean you have you know Left Bank, you have uh, LB Stakes, you have Meso. How do you how did your uh, restaurants handle the crisis as far as employees? How did the furlough go? Did you have to, how did you manage that? How do you restructure? Uh, we, had, we had to, at the beginning, we had to follow over 400 employees. 400. 
Yeah, because between all the restaurants we have, you know, so left bank in, uh, we have left bank Lacks San Jose, Park. left bank Menlo Park, left bank Larkspur, we have LB Steak in San Jose, and we have Meso, and we also partner in a restaurant, I'm also partner in a restaurant called Counter in Menlo Park. So when you look at all those things, when, when they shut down, it was shut down, nobody said, oh, we're going to do take out tomorrow. It took a while to organize yourself and to start seeing what other people are doing, you know, and, uh, you know, you pretty much, you know, you, you unfortunately, you have to stop the bleeding and the bleeding is unfortunately putting people in furlough and for some even laying them off, you know, I mean, because there's just no other way, you know, so difficult decisions. Uh, when we started reopening for takeout, we brought back a minimum staff some managers, some allies, uh, but uh, really minimum staff. And now then we are open in a terrace in uh, Larkspur, in Menlo Park, in San Jose. We are bringing more staff, but it's still minimum staff. It's not, we're not open inside. You know, San Jose has an advantage. We're in Santana Roo, and in wow. Santana Roo, there is huge outside. Uh, you know, or uh, a landlord, uh, federal realties have put in every restaurant, have closed the streets, and mm -hmm. have put hundreds more tables outside. Yeah. yeah. So every restaurant has hundreds of seats more. So even the inside is closed, you still can, you do about 50, 60% of business with better than 25 or none. You know, so uh, like in Larkspur, you know, we do about 30, 30, 40% of business. And we're doing a good, good business now. There's a lot of regulars. And, you know, it's fun. We have a terrace. The weather is nice. It's nicer than the city. And it's nicer than a lot of time than uh, Socialito or Mill Valley. So, you know, it's definitely where they get the sun early in the morning. And uh, it's there's late at night. It's before the fog arrives in Larkspur. Don't on Larkspur, it takes a while. I so, you know. I wonder why they don't do that in San Francisco. We are closing streets in the city for, you know, for people to go biking and exercising. Many streets are closed for, you know, for families and people to enjoy the street. I wonder why we don't do it for businesses. If, if they are, if you look at La Folie, like, you know, like, I, 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 I think, you know, uh, the mayor and the supervisor, whoever the decision maker, need to really help the restaurant to really give them part of the street, part of the parkings. Otherwise, they won't be able to survive with a few tables. The bad thing is in San Francisco, it's, Weather. as you know, in the summer, yeah. it's cold. It's cold. The fogs roll in, and sometimes the fogs stay all day, like yesterday or the, the 14th of July. I was, I saw German the other day, oh, yeah. and uh, he, he was at, uh, uh, he was buying eaters for, for uh, Amelie. Because it was so cold, he told me, you know, I mean, uh, people were wearing gloves, they were wearing hats, they were, you know, they were cold, and some of them didn't stay. So it's very difficult to do, you know, uh, a business uh, in San Francisco, not knowing if you, I mean, if you have beautiful weather, like we had a few weeks ago, it rained, that works. But otherwise, it's inconsistent. You know, you can have the fog rolling in at five o'clock, and here is your dinner business, and people are freezing. It's not enjoyable to eat in a cold, you know, environment. It's difficult. Well, I know that Germain at Amélie has been trying his best to make things work out, right? You're talking about trying to be... Oh, yeah, you know? he's, he, he's smart. He's very smart and very aggressive. And he's, he'll make, he like, like I said, you know, on the 14th, it was very cold. On the 15th, he was at Home Depot buying, you know, eaters because he cannot afford... Yeah. Losing those tables outside, even if it's cold. I mean, you know, it's what you do. You invest and you say, okay, you know, we're going to invest on eaters because otherwise people are not going to stay. They're going to go to the place across the street or maybe somewhere where there is eaters because they don't want to eat like this. It's miserable. I think something, of, you know, we talked about that the last time, but something that make, made you successful on your business successful was the fact that you were at your restaurant every day uh, yeah. or six, six days a week. Six Today, days a week for many years until, until we closed one more day. 
I was there six days a week, pretty much yeah. for, let's say, 29, 29th of the 33 years, I was there six days a week. And, and what you realize is that a lot of those businesses that have an impact on people, if you look at Chapeau, if you look at Amelie, if you look at, yeah. uh, you know, Iriwaya, uh, right? You were there last week. They are successful because they are there. They yeah. are at the business. And you, you care about your guests, you care about your people, but you want to show them, you know, it's not just, oh, you know, I made it, so I don't need to be there. Yeah. And I'm surrounded by, by great talent, great. But, you know, people want to see you. People want to know that there is a face behind that business. And when they can associate the face, you know, they're expecting you to be there. They love to meet you. They love to see you. They want you to sign a menu. They want you to give them a hug. Not now, but you know, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's very important for them. They're becoming your friend. They're becoming part of the La Folie family. It's what it was at the end. It was, you know, all those customers who have been coming for years. They they wanted to be there one last time. Some of them made reservations as soon as they were closing. They made reservations five, six times. They were coming every week. So nowadays, more than ever, maybe as an advice, <laughs> if you have a restaurant today, you need to be at your restaurant every single day, the whole day. Yes, and, and, you know, I think some people are successful not being there. Don't get me right. wrong, you know, I think, you know, and they maybe the smarter one because at the end <laughs> of the day, you know, I mean, the one who are not there, but still have a very successful restaurant, I upload them. You know, I upload them because they surround themselves with great people. And maybe, you know, sometimes it's a question of trust. And at the beginning, I have to say, you know, I feel like I needed to be there. I needed to be there. And then it blew on me and it get to a point where I feel like I never could leave. So where some restaurateurs and chefs are very smart and they surround themselves with chefs who are as good or better than them, you know, sometimes. And, you know, they are able to not be there and people don't mind as long as they get great service, they get great food and they feel like then they get what they pay for, you know? So, you know, there's restaurants, you know, I mean, I won't name them, but where the chef is never there and they are very successful. You know, I find myself sometimes going to a place even for a waiter, because the waiter was so good. So part of your team, you will go for the owner, for the chef, but sometimes for the waiter, because the waiter is so nice. You know, I have a few faces that comes to me when I think about places I like to go, but I identify places with the people working there, right? So it's, I agree. And it's why I think in the old days, in the old days, you were, you know, you had the, the maitre d', the captain and the server, but, you know, and it was important for the guest, but the chef, had a lot of time, the chefs and the cooks uh, had a disrespect for the front of the house. I mean, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, judging, but, you know, it was the way it was because, oh, we work so much harder and this and that. At the end of the day, today, you have to realize the success of a restaurant, you know, it's probably even more in front than it is. The food has to be great. But I will say it's 50-50, but it could be 60-40 even. Because let's say you go to a restaurant and you like going to that restaurant because just like you say, because a server, or you know, and that server, she is wonderful. She, she, you know, really take care of you. She describes the food wonderfully. But, you know, one day, for whatever reasons, you know, your food get overcooked or, you know, it's not the same. And, but that server is here. And that server is going to make you, yeah, I'm really sorry, Pierre or Mr. B, you know, for, you know, let me do something for you. You know, let me, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure the manager know and will, you know, and suddenly you get something, you get camp or, you know, you get someone who, who's re-inviting you. And suddenly you feel like, well, you know, I mean, they really took care of the problem. It was maybe not the best day that day, but, you know, I'm going back because of that server who really realized and listened to me and realized that, hey, you know, I mean, something happened today, but, you know, I mean, and you were not making a big deal out of it, but you wanted them to know. 
And, you know, it's the best thing you can help a restaurant, let them know, hey, you know, you today, unfortunately, I was a little disappointed. And well, what were you disappointed? Oh, you know, my fish came a little bit overcooked or, you know, my meat or my vegetables were over salty or, uh, you know, I mean, everybody makes mistakes. As much as we try to be perfect, you know, I always say, you know, there should be some imperfection in perfection so that way we always can get better and we always can, you know, if it's too perfect, it's too, you know, square yeah. and robotic. You yeah. want some, you want to feel the touch of a human who, who with passions, have cooked your food, have put it on a plate, have, you want to feel it, you know, and if it's, a, if it's too, so precise to the point that you say, oh, you know, I look like a robot did that, you know, I mean, that food that's, you know, it's just too perfect. It looked like a painting, but a painting was with, with no, you know, you need a little bit of things, you know, I mean, one day you're going to have the, the cook who seal the meat a little bit more and you may say, well, I like that crust. I like it a lot, matter of fact. You know, it didn't come out of a bag sous vide. You know, right. there was a person behind it. You see, hey, Roland, people, people are writing down that someone just tell you that what they loved about La Folie was the fact that they could see the chef with his team and coming out to greet us. You are yeah. you, know. you know, it's, you know, it's the biggest compliment and it makes me happy to go out and visit every table and hopefully, you know, get a smile but seeing a smile on the face of customer and tell you how great the meal was and tell you how wonderful of an evening he had and tell you, hey, you know, we didn't know about you, but we're going to come back. You know, that makes you feel good, you know. You know, you, you know how good you are? I tell you how good you are. And when I say you, it's you, you and the whole family, okay? The, the La Folie family. I, there was just a, a small, on Facebook again, Someone said, I unfortunately never had a chance to enjoy your famous dishes while living in the Bay Area. So, you know, they feel sad not being able to come. But there is a question. Do you have any, any partners to recommend in L.A.? Oh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the thing is, in LA, I don't know L.A., but... Uh... Uh, they, I don't know LA that well, especially now or today, but there is some wonderful restaurant, you know, uh, Citrine, uh, Yasuya Citrine, a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, I'm trying to think now of all the, the restaurants we are in LA and I'm not going to think uh, fast enough. So, but I know there is some great restaurant in Los Angeles. We are doing some wonderful things, and uh, uh, I think you know, visiting. It's one thing I want to do because everybody asks me. Oh, so where do you used to go to eat? You know, where do you eat in, uh, uh, at night? I say I don't eat. I'm at La Folie, you know. Uh, and on Sunday it was the day at home, you know. So a lot of time people uh, there's so many restaurants in the city I've never been to. I've never been to because I didn't have time. So now it's my chance hopefully when we reopen to go visit those restaurants and to spend time with those fabulous chefs we have here in the city, you know. Well, uh, hey, it's, Roland, it's Roland LA, LA is good, but San Francisco has the most Michelin star combined as a city more than New York, right? For the first time. We, we are the city of food. We, we, are, the, we are the city of food and... Uh, but I will not even traduce that in the, in the sense of storm, in the sense of people. And the, the thing is, I think, yeah, you know, we're so close to our uh, farmers and there's so many young chefs who have embraced the fact that young and not so young like me, I guess, you know, embrace the fact that going to the farmer's market, following the seasons and serving, you know, what's here locally available to us and putting it on a plate and sometimes a very simple way. We don't need to be very uh, complicated. I love that 
picture huh? when you do it. I know. Great. I know. This it. is our green room. Yeah, the green room. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's why we used to have all our, uh, you know, parties and uh, also open for the We should talk about that. We should talk about that. Later. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, it's, it, 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 I think, you know, the chefs here in San Francisco have really connected with the farms and the farmers and uh, they are cooking, you know, with their hearts and it doesn't matter what kind of food they do, French, Italian, Chinese, you know, uh, Mexican. There's, you know, I was saying, uh, I was saying Laurence also, he has a restaurant called Nopalito. He has Nopa and right. Nopalito. And the palito, uh, he closed one of them. So you know, it's it, it's sad, but you know, I, I know you will bounce back because they're doing fabulous food. Sometimes very simple, but very very good. You know, it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be, you know, two star, three star, one star. It needs to be good, and the customer will tell you that. And if they have good food, they don't care really how many star you have. They care, then you care about them. Well. What is, could you let us know, because I remember that, could you let us know what is your favorite dish? Because you're talking about simplicity, but good and authentic. What to you is your favorite dish? Because I know it. <laughs> so, but you know, I have few, so I don't remember which one I told you last time, but you know, a good roast chicken. That, you know, that's with, the one you told me. Uh, with, with, you know, usually I, I put, you know, tied up the chicken, season it inside, put some thyme and rosemary and garlic, and you can put lemon if you want. And usually I put it in the oven and you baste it and all that. But, you know, I put turnips, I put carrots, I put uh, more garlic, onions, potatoes, whatever you like around it. And you let it roast together. It's wonderful. And you serve that with a nice little salad, mesplans or uh, lettuce or whatever you like, you know, really serve that with a salad. And that's it. Here's your meal. And you have your vegetable. We're roasting in a pan with the juice of the chicken. It's wonderful. You know, and the other thing that I do often at home, because, you know, us chef, we love a good steak. So a good ribeye, you know, it's uh, always good. And same thing, you know, you'll saute some spinach, roast, you know, some potatoes. And uh, if you want to do French fries, do French fries. But at home, it's a, it's a process. So, you know, it's uh, definitely, you can roast some little baby potatoes, you know, in the ovens and uh, finish them with a little bit of butter and some fresh herbs, you know, uh, and uh, you do your steak medium rare. I use a cast iron pan. The cast iron pan is very important because, you know, it gives you a nice sear. And usually if it's a ribeye, it has enough fat, you don't need to put anything in a pan. Turn on the pan, let the pan heat up, season your steak with salt and paper, and you can be heavy on the paper. Let's say you want to do a paper steak, then, you know, see the meat on one side, let it cook for five minutes, they found out the thickness, of course. You know, I like my, my, my steak feeling thick, you know. An important part also, you want the steak to be at room temperature by the time you put it in the pan. So pull it out of the refrigerator. Don't pull it out of the refrigerator and put it on a, on a grill or in a cast iron pan. Just make sure it's at least at room temperature so that where all that fat is going to melt and make sure after you cook it, you let it rest before you cut it. Let it rest at least five minutes. There you go. Hey, <laughs> we got this and, shit. And, right and, and, <laughs> and, and if you want to do a pan jus, so very easy for the pan jus. So you take the suc of that, that pan with a lot of, you can crack your paper, or put it on your steak a little more. You put your, you know, so your pan, you have all, all that seasoning and all that. You deglaze with a cognac. Ooh. So you be careful, turn off the flame, otherwise yeah. you're going to have a flame <laughs> coming out in your wood. So deglaze with the cognac, let it boil so that way the alcohol is gone and turn it back on and add a little bit of cream. And here you have your, you know, you can, if you don't have green paper corn, you just have a paper corn sauce. You know, you don't have veal stock at home probably, so you know, you're going to use veal stock. You can do that with red wine or so. Let it reduce, finish it with a little fresh butter, you know, like have a little bordelaise, add some shallots to it, you know. So, you know, cooking at home, and it should be the same in, a, in, in, in some restaurant. It should be simple. It should be really, you know, really, really simple, but really, really good. And, uh, be, uh, you know, 
take uh, take attention to the technique and uh, to to the quality of the food you buy. Roland, I, cannot, down to that. I cannot agree more with what you say because my one of my favorite food is a very good bread with a very good butter, uh, uh, semi salty, and uh, beurre salé, and with camembert. Ah, uh, voilà, you know. No, no cooking required. <laughs> no cooking required, you know, but good saucisson and uh, oh, yeah. good pâté. And uh, pâté, if you don't make your own pâté, you can buy some good pâté. And I tell you the other day, I went to see Claude at 165. Oh, I have you too. And he had, he had a beautiful pâté de campagne. He does those six kilos. I got a slice. It was wonderful. Wonderful, well, wonderful. We had that for lunch with my crew. We were doing a dinner oh. at some customers of mine and, uh, in Ellsboro. And uh, I told the customer, I said, you need to try that patty. And uh, they had lunch with us <laughs> before well, the dinner. You know, it's funny you say that because I just stopped yesterday at 165 to try the rillette. Yeah, the he does a great rillette. job. Yeah. And the sausages, too, they're both, it's fantastic. They're doing a very good job with their charcuterie. No, Sorry, Sebastian from Fabrique Delis. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm talking about home, you know, home yes. So Sebastian does a good job. Oh, yeah. So is, so is Pascal Bosset down in, uh, in, uh, uh, yeah. in Los Angeles and all that. A lot of people are great charcuterie, but I'm saying, you know, if you want to buy uh, local products, definitely Sebastian from Fabrique Delis, and you can find them in the store. But if you buy something a little bit more artisanal, Go to 165. He sell it at the shop with the pastry shop down there. Right. So you know, I mean, absolutely. You know, you definitely uh, look at things like this. You know, I mean, for me, it's supporting everybody. You know, I mean, I go to the farmers market and I buy from. Uh, you know, I definitely buy the merguez. You know, or the boudinoir from oh, yeah. uh, Fabrique Delis. Oh yes. Hey uh, Roland, you know I'm from Normandy. Alors boudinoir. With apple and a bit of calva on top, with crème fraîche, just like you said. <laughs> oh, oh, oh la la! Oh, oh la la! Oh, but that's the. That's one of my. Oh, no, that's paradise. That's yeah, it's paradise. It's paradise. Uh, no, I know, and it's no simple thing, you know. Then us French will probably like better boudinoir than most American, but some American love boudinoir as well, you know. So. Sorry, hey, Roland, you're talking and drinking. Huh? Look. And I'm drinking my wine. Look, look at my wine. <laughs> oh, yes. Can you, hey, oh, you know what? Can you tell us about this wine, Roland? Can you, can you tell us the story of this wine and what it is so, and where we can access it? Sur un coup de tête. So I told you earlier that I'm from uh, the Beaujolais. I was born in Villefranche-sur-Saône. Correct. Yep. And uh, the Cru du Beaujolais, you know, I, I think Beaujolais, unfortunately, has, uh, you know, been known for the Beaujolais Nouveau and people don't know this fabulous crew. And the Beaujolais is part of Burgundy. It's the bastard child of Burgundy. And, you know, it's a gamma grape, but you know, they do some great Beaujolais, you know, and this one is made by one of our cousin in Chirouble, beautiful Chirouble is one of the highest, un coup de tête, voila, <laughs> <laughs> un coup de tête. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> so, a coup de tête in English, uh, I mean, translate to on a whim, you know. And uh, so that wine was from Chirubes, the highest elevation of Beaujolais. The vine are 50 years old. You can find the wine, we have them at Left Bank, uh, and uh, I think at LB Steak as well. I don't think at Meso we have it, but we definitely have it at the Left Bank at the Brasserie. And as for it, if you don't see it, tell them where is the, the wine from Roland sur un coup de tête? You know, so it's a great wine. It's easy to drink. It's perfect for a picnic also. You can drink it a little chill or not. I would say at least to the temperature of the cellar, around 55 degrees is great. But if you want it a little bit chiller, you can do that too. But uh, uh, I will, you know, it's not a Beaujolais Nouveau. It's definitely a wine with a lot of structures. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have a lot of characters and a lot of layers. Roland, you have to be very careful with what you're saying because your brother, Georges, yeah. is watching. And you know, with wine, he's no joke. Oh, so I know he's... George is watching. He was just right there. He passed by. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, George has moved to my house and he's my new gardener. 
<laughs> so he went from sommelier to gardener. <laughs> you know, he loves being outside. He's outside, you know, almost seven, eight hours a day. He's just outside, you know, taking care of the plant. He just pick up uh, one cigar. Yeah, yeah, but you Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am by myself. My guest is going to come back. Huh? He's, he's, oh, yeah, you Oh, wow. All my peaches. Oh, wow, look at that. Wow, wow, yeah. yeah. Woo! Oh, you can do pieces. tarts, you can do confiture. Confiture. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I did, uh, yesterday I did uh, pork loin with peaches oh, and wow. a honey vinegar from Beauj Huile, les, les huiles du Beaujolais. Uh, 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 vinaigre de miel from the huile du Beaujolais. So, oh, you know, wow. I think, you know, same thing. Add some pork on the loins. Uh, I sear them a little bit, but slowly. I put some onion, then I cut in big pieces. I cut some peaches, they're small peaches, so they're not huge peach. No, no. They're, they're small, but they're so delicious. And I have so many, I said, I'm going to do a peach, uh, you know, uh, a pork loin with peach. So I think I'll deglaze the pan after with uh, the honey vinegar. I believe a little bit oh of beer stock, so I sheet it a little bit, you know, I put a beer stock and then I roll back the pork loin in it. And uh, we, with, with that, uh, you know, which you serve some vegetables and all that, you know, and it's good. Well, hey, it's Roland, good. Roland, we are all coming to your house. Everybody who is online. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all coming. Hey, Roland, hey. A, quick, a quick paraphrase. I just want to say hi to Céline Goody, who is from Goody's Charcuterie. We were talking about charcuterie before. Oh. We, we did not mention them. No, and it's true. Goody, I and mean, Céline, Céline. Did a fantastic job. You guys, we are thinking of you too. You're doing very good charcuterie. Uh, so I'm telling, send me a saucisson or a pâté. There yeah. you go. <laughs> hey, send me one too, and next time we can we can show it <laughs> and we can enjoy it. But goodies, goodies, G O U D Y. Why? Yes. Okay, goodies charcuterie is doing amazing charcuterie as well, guys. They are based in the South Bay and they are all around the Bay Area. So goodies is doing good job. And on top of it, today we have a singer. Her name is. Virginie Marine. I don't know if you know Virginie Marine, Roland. She, I think she's no. based in uh, Berkeley and she's a very talented singer. And you can find her online and she's watching us. So the wine will make you feel like Virginie. Cheers, Virginie. So, you know, can you show us again the bottle if you don't mind, Roland? The of coup course. de tête, just one more time for people to have time to. So, sur un coup de tête, hey, the, the, the label is fantastic. I really like that. They did a very good job by Roland Passo with the French flag. It is very nice. So uh, if you guys don't know where to get it, you can, we talked about it, but if you have more questions, you can always put it in the comments. We will make sure to let you know where to get this bo fantastic Beaujolais. And I'd let well, 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 it's I need a bottle. Girl, so. I, need, I need that bottle for my apéro. Every time I have an apéro, instead of having this wine, I exactly. have it because of the label. I'd rather have sur un coup de tête. You know, exactly. Much better, too. Mary, much then, better wine. Then every time I can show it, and every time I can enjoy a better wine. So that will work for me. So, you know, we were talking about experience, uh, Roland. Sorry, I'm going to come back a little bit. But just when I had very important customers, or when I had someone uh, coming in that I wanted to impress, I tried to bring them to places that not only had good food, but characters, you know, people. And I'm just going to make a small paraphrase, but one of the funny place I like to be to bring people to that was uh, uh, good, very good food, but not to impress, but to have fun was chez maman. Do you do you know the guy called Bully? Do you remember Bully? He worked for years at uh, chez maman in on Portray Royal. Oh yes, 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 on Portray Royal. Yes, I remember. Where is he now? He was a very funny character and. I was bringing people there just because of the ambience. He oh, was the, bringing... the ambience was magnifique. I mean, you know, when they opened that place, I think, you know, I mean, it, it was magic. It was like going back to Paris, to France. Uh, and, you know, the magic of it was the fact also that all the server almost were French. Yeah, yeah, you know? no, yeah, yeah. It was very French, right? So I'm just... Uh, it, it was just to come back to just what I was just had that in mind. And Renault, Renault de la Croix. Do you, do you remember Renault de la Croix? Does that sound bad? Renault used to work at Chapeau before. 
for uh, for quite some time. Well, those are just people that come to me when we talk about food that I love so much, like you do. So, Roland, can you tell us about, you know, there is a label, or I don't know if you call it a label, certification, or, but can you tell us, I don't know what you call it, actually, Maître Cuisinier de France. Oh, Master Chef of France. What, what that so, is. so, the Master Chef of France, Yes. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's definitely, you have the book. Yeah. So it's an association who uh, started, uh, I don't even know, I mean, it's probably uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and it's, when it started, we didn't have uh, really the affiliations of United States came much later, you know, so now we have uh, uh, a lot of, you know, you have to be French. Uh, you have to also have a parent. And uh, so uh, you have to have someone who sponsor you to become the maître cuisinier de France, but you have to have at least, you know, I think it's 10 years in a business, you know, so it's not like, oh, you know, you're just starting and uh, you're going to become a master chef. So, and usually, uh, as a parent, you have to make sure that the person that you're sponsoring is really a professional and is going to represent the maître cuisinier like we want to be represented. Got it. Well, and there are not too many here. I mean, we have Fabrice uh, in Berkeley. Uh, in San Francisco, there's Fabrice Marcon, there's Joel Guillon. There is now uh, David Bastille. Oh, yes, was, David. Oh, oui. So all, the, all those used to work for me at Left <laughs> Bar, but David still is. But you know, Joel used to be my corporate chef. Uh, and uh, uh, Fabrice used to be the chef in Larkspur. And uh, David uh, is the chef in uh, San Jose, also the regional chef for the Left Bar. So, uh, uh, and uh, we and have that's... also Claude Le Toic. Claude Le Toic. Yes. We have Gérald Irigoyen. Yes, of course. People we have, have of, of, of course, Laurent Maric. Yes. Uh, uh, we used to have Xavier Salomon, who moved ah. down to uh, Mexico, to Cabo. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, and we're trying to get more people to, uh, to be on board here in San Francisco. I was trying to get Dominique to be part of it because I love to have more women. Oh, as yeah. a maître cuisinier. So the maître cuisinier, after a certain time, uh, you can have, you, you have, you get voted by your peers. Uh, they had what they call the, la toque d'argent. Oh, yes. So uh, I think uh, every uh, year, I mean... Claude, Claude got it last year. Okay. And Claude has it for a year. And for our next congrès, he's going to have it for longer because I don't know when it's going to be our next congrès. Uh, but, uh, you get your name on the plaque. It's a beautiful silver tuck. It's quite heavy. And uh, so Claude was at it last year. And I think I got mine in oh, 2004, I think. Not 100% sure about that. Met, so uh, maybe, sorry, maybe it was. I'm right here, but it says Maître Cuisinier, and then it's De France. Maître de France. Cuisinier de France. And, uh, you know, you can go online, uh, oh, right. you know, www, maître cuisinier de France, I think it's that org, I don't know if it's that com, it's that, I, I don't know. know, you have to check, I don't remember, I will have to look at my phone, but I turn it off, you know, and you, you want people and, to bug me. And all the, all the chefs came last year to San Francisco, you guys were All the chefs came last year, all so we chef. had a, a fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, event for four days where, uh, you know, some, uh, the, the Gala Dinner was, matter of fact, at the Four Seasons, Norman Market Street. Oh, yeah. And uh, then uh, the first uh, few days, we, uh, uh, we did an event in uh, Half Moon Bay. Yes. Xavier was not there, but he organized that one quite well. He was outside, it was beautiful. They did a fabulous job. And then the next day we were going to Napa. So we went to Napa. And we stop at Tétanger, yes. who uh, they receive us really. It was absolutely wonderful. So we had a little uh, uh, cocktail aperitif. And then from then, we went to Adoc, where Thomas Keller was waiting for us for a picnic. And uh, we, uh, 
uh, had a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous time. We spent three, four hours, I think, with Thomas, and then he took us to his garden, where we we give him the maître, the, we give him the maître cuisinier, la médaille d'argent, and we had another reception over there. So more food, more champagne. And uh, it was in be a beautiful garden, beautiful young bill. He also gave us a tour of all his kitchens and his wine cellar. We had fabulous time. Uh, we even saw Jean-Charles Boisset over there. Oh, yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. Uh, and John, the famous Jean-Charles, you know, uh, <laughs> was, it was fabulous. We, we stopped by the atelier and he was right there. So we had great time. Uh, and then after that, uh, we went to Mondavi where we had a dinner, you know, uh, uh, Alfresco uh, under the star over there in a vineyard that was beautiful and then we drove back to San Francisco and then uh, the, the next day was our gala dinner so we were at work all day uh, you know obviously that day and then uh, they, some of them stayed a few more days and some of them left you know but it was fabulous time really 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 good time I, just... well, I wish we had more time to, to show them more things but I think you know, it was important to, I wanted them to visit also the school, but we didn't have time to do that in Napa, you know, the, because it's a fabulous school, but you know, we could not do everything or do the, you know, the copia. Yeah. In, uh, in, uh, I mean, in Napa as well, you know, so. Ma Maria, Maria on Facebook, she was saying that Maître, uh, you know, uh, Cuisinier de France, but she was as well as referring at M-O-F. Um, is... M-O-F, you have to ask Claude. Claude, uh, different. Claude Lotoic is the only M-O-F cuisinier in San Francisco. M-O-F, so it's a competition who happen every four years. Uh, you have a, a semi-final in regional. So, you know, you have to be French or uh, I think you still have to be. And I think you may be able to do it if you live in France, I don't know, but don't quote me on that. But you have to, uh, I'm pretty sure you have to be French because uh, I was going to try it one year and uh, uh, chicken out, I think. Uh, it was years ago, I was in Dallas at the time. And uh, 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 you, you have a recipe with a classic recipe and you are, I think it may have changed now, but you have to execute it exactly and you are judged by older chef you have a timing, so you usually get, you know, uh, an appetizer, entrée dessert, or an, an entrée and a dessert. I forget exactly how it works, but you know, and uh, you get the semi-final, and then you get the eliminations. The, uh, uh, not, the the last day is not one person; it could be four or five people. So by region, you get the semi-final, and each regions could have one guy who gets selections or not. You know, you have to have so many points. So it's pretty tough. It's a very tough competition. It's very well regarded. So when you see them wearing the col bleu, blanc, rouge, only the MOF can wear those. If you see a chef wearing the col bleu, blanc, rouge, you can ask them and say, you, are you an MOF? And if he says no, he has no right to wear that. Right. It's like wearing the, wearing the general, uh, you know, stars and you know, you know, the general, unless, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, you get the MRO over at France, pâtissier, charcutier, cuisinier, uh, I think, uh, uh, all, all the métier de bouche, but also menuisier, you get uh, the guy who work the uh, la pierre, you know, it, it's all type of métier, and it's, it's really, really, well respected. And uh, you have to have Claude, I don't know if you had him on l'apéro, but you have to have him explain to you the day he passed his mayor over at France and what made him win. And he, he made, I think, I forget which, uh, which magazine he was, he made the, the cover of that magazine the next day or the, the, the newspaper, his dish did. Hmm. I will ask him because I haven't seen Claude for a while, but I've been going to 165. No, no, it's really interesting and he can go through it about the, the preparations, the competitions, and uh, he's a fabulous uh, chef and 
fabulous professional, so you should ask him, definitely. Hey, Roland, you know, you do, let me ask you a question. Who talks more, you know, uh, among all the maîtres cuisiniers de France? Who yeah. do you think talks the most? Do you think, I have a little idea among all of you, who talks the most or who likes to talk the most? And I will say, you, I, will, I put you number one. I, I think and, I am. But we are the other one anyway. <laughs> no, but there is maybe one who beats you. And I think you will know who beats you as far as talking. Who can talk a lot? Among the maîtres cuisiniers de France of here, of, of the From region. San Francisco, here? That, that, that you named? Uh, uh, it could be Laurent Marie. Ah, no? Why would I have said Fabrice? Oh, Fabrice. Oh, yeah. Fabrice can talk. Fabrice can talk. That's true. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Laurent loves to talk. We all love to talk. We all love, like to tell <laughs> our stories funny. and all that. I mean, Fabrice has some fabulous stories, you know. He was in Lyon. He was at Paul Bocuse for years. And he had some great stories. So, yeah. Uh, Fabrice can definitely talk. Especially Fabrice likes to talk about sports. If you talk oh, about yeah, sports, soccer. Oh, yes. la, la. oh, la, you're la, done. Oh, la, 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 <laughs> la, la, la. <laughs> hey, uh, Roland, it is 6-11. So we've been uh, above the hour. Um, we can, I mean, I have... It's up to you. I mean, no. I have nothing to do but drink. Well, you know, listen, Roland, you see all those questions? I didn't ask you any of those questions. So, oh, la, 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 la. Well, on est dans la merde. So, you know, uh, so I, I didn't even look at those questions, actually. But uh, let me t ask you one thing. Uh, what are you the most, and I know you have so many things that happened to you in your career, but is there something that you're most proud of? What is the thing that makes you the most proud of? Uh, in a sense, in, in which way of the people that... So, uh, in a sense, alors, let, alors, let's, let's do two things. Uh, Business-wise, what are you the most proud of? You know, is it the success of La Folie? Is it uh, because you've been able to be involved in so many businesses? No, I mean, it's definitely the success of La Folie. It was my baby, and it was my baby from the beginning to the end. And uh, we had some ups and downs, but I feel like then uh, you learn a lot, you see a lot of things. And they helped me build those other business, definitely. But La Folie always has been mine. I was solo with my wife on that one. And we went through some difficult time, like, like a lot of businesses. But we went through it and we, uh, you know, navigate the waves and all that. And we were able to uh, be, at the end, very successful. And I think we finished on a big bang. So that made me very happy. Even then, I wish that a young chef or a chef, doesn't matter if he's young or not, but, you know, will take it over. Because, you know, I would love to see that place that you have been, you, uh, being taken over by, by somebody. Could you tell us a bit more about this room in particular? So this room was added on. Uh, La Folie was 32 years old. 20 years ago, 20, 22 years ago, I took over the business next door. Uh, and I opened that room. The font was leased, was subleased to Pascal from La Boulange at the beginning. And then it became way too small and I wanted to open a lounge. So it was the perfect timing. He didn't finish the timing of his lift, but didn't matter because I took it over and we did the, the lounge. So that room was for private dining, private party, but also for the overflow of La Folie. But we did wedding, we did some special party here. We had many, many notorieties. And, uh, you know, it's fun, you know, when uh, you have a restaurant where, uh, you know, a French president come by and have lunch, you know, so that was pretty awesome for us. I think it was, you know, we had Clinton, but having the president of France and, you know, uh, I know someone had posted that the other day, you have to realize that not only we had one, but we had two presidents at that time. Because Macron, who was not president, became president, but uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, our president today, was at that lunch with uh, François Hollande. Wow. So yeah. that, oh, matter of fact, I brought you the, 
Oh, wow. Oh, you go. Ben ben you signed by Monsieur. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oh, oh this is cool. Hollande. So signed by, uh, by uh, President, by President Hollande. Hollande. On vient d'avoir hey. de salade de crabe dans jeunesse sur un panacotta de fenouil de pommes vertes, poitrine de canard à l'orange et son gâteau de, so de cuisse confite, purée euh, euh, tarte tatin, et puis on avait un petit. Euh, it, it, was, it was a nice lunch. I have, fun. I have something even better than this. Let me show you. I got something to show you. <laughs> I look, love that. Look. It's signed. Oh la la. Attends, attends, hold on, hold on. I know it's not too, too. Wow. Wow. Do you see that? L'apéro. Ah oui, oui, oui. Ah bah oui. <laughs> Reconnais la signature. Hein? Recognize the signature. Look at that, Roland. This is from you. It's here. It's in this house. <laughs> Hey, it's in the safe. It's in the safe. It's in the safe. Good, good. You never know. Yeah. People may come. You know, try That's to right. steal it from you. <laughs> hey, Roland, listen, I think it's time to part ways. I really want to thank you for being such uh, a great uh, interviewee. I don't know who says that. Uh, for, for being who you are. Because I feel like I can, we, I can, I can make this happen for three hours. But people don't have three hours to listen. No, they don't. They don't. And yeah. I, I want to thank all the people who are uh, watching and listening to us. Thank you very much. And hopefully we do that again. Who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah, why not? And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Please, everybody, support your local businesses. Support your local restaurants. It's important in those very tough times that you go at the restaurant, support them. There is, it's a very, very tough situation, as you know, for restaurants. They really need you. Go there once a week, twice a week. But, you know, they need your support. Um, if you have any comments, any questions, ask us. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, L'apéro, we have as well. We have a shop. If you want to shop from L'apéro products, from the marinière to hats to uh, uh, cups. Must. We have a lot of stuff. So you have mask? The mask. We have the mask. We have some very nice masks too. We have St. James mask and stuff. We need your support as well. Not as much as the restaurants. So put the priority, please, on the restaurants because they really need you. Um, Chef Roland Passo, thank you very much. Any last thank words you. for everybody? Do you have anything to add, Roland, before we part ways? Stay safe and healthy and wear your mask. <laughs> Stay safe and healthy. There you go. Very well. Everybody, be well. Merci beaucoup. À bientôt. À bientôt. Bon Au apéro. Revoir. Merci Roland. Vive ciao, ciao. Et vive Salut. Salut. Allez.